Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last series of Europe, in which we're playing as everyone's favorite German dude from WW Dos, Oscar. Oh, what a man, but if you'd like to read about his bio, please go right ahead, and if you'd like to read about the brigade he leads here in, was it, Western Siberia, please go right ahead. Um, he has some se very severe research penalties, which makes sense, I mean... I don't think he cares much for researching stuff, he just wants to be a bandit here in Russia, but it is what it is, and I'll be honest, I might have to use console commands for us to make sure we do okay here, because this is very difficult. Um, but let's begin with the focus, shall we? The Black Bandits of the South, Oscar Delvanga, has led us to victory and enrichment against foes weak and strong in the time and time again, from our service within the SS to our escape when the Wehrmacht tried to disarm us, to our capture of the lands on Orsk, he has only shown us the way. And that way is to take. We will take what we want, and we want it all. Everything. And the Southern Urals. Wealth. Women. Land. Belongs to us. It just, just hasn't been collected yet. We're going to correct that. Because now, we got to talk about this stuff. So we have uh, br the Brigade Secure. Better talk about National Spears first. We have the Luftwaffe Terror Bombing, which we pretty much probably all know. We have the Bandit State, which we lose political power, gain more organization. A flat amount of organization. We get Recover Rate, War Support. We lose some cap. We get a little bit more attack, but we lose 50% research speed, which is actually much worse than 15%. I think it's more like 1,500% or maybe 150%, but regardless, our soldiers are disorderly, which is not very good. A monthly inspection of the troops by Dolvanga himself shall gauge their organization. And then we also have officers content with Dolvanga, which gets us better entrenchment speed, out of supply, and army XP gain, which doesn't really matter too much. So, we basically have to balance the soldiers and the officers for this, and the facts just show you where we're at. Purge your officer core, which hurts us for a while, but... Um, our officer corps will become content. We have random executions. Organization level of the soldiers will go up, which is not bad. Capital punishment, which requires a lot of manpower. It goes up by two levels, we get more stability. We distribute loot more equally, we get more war support. And we will ensure that loot from recent raids is shared more equally among the men. This promise of greater bounty for the common soldiery will no doubt raise general support for the future raids or heavily favor the officers, in which we will ensure that a majority of the loot from recent raids goes to those who deserve it the most. The officers, to so placated, uh, their increased support will allow us to further our specific goals, which gives you a lot of political power, which is nice. And then we have the Black Bandits, the show of strength. We need at least seven divisions in Orsk. We have five. Those who live within our lands must know who to who they owe their lives to. To who holds absolute power over them? We will remind them of this through showing them the strength of the larger brigade. So, cowed, we will be able to direct increased focus towards our specific further goals. Which is not bad, but pillage the land. If we're to raid, we need weapons. Those in our lands must be hiding some, so we will work to find them so that they can be better put to a greater purpose. The other valuables we are sure to find will be prior prizes instead. And besides, so get some rifles for five, 500 manpower. That's, a, eh, that's okay. Terror is a remedy for resistance. Though most of our lands are smart enough to give us what we want and keep their heads down, others are not. Insurgents have been attacking our men and this will no longer uh, be allowed to happen. We will show the people that what happens to such partisans and a campaign of utter terror will ensure that none dare support them. Cost 500 manpower from their homes to the firing line. We need men for the brigade. Luckily, there are many men within our territory who can be conscripted and pressed into service. They will, of course, be unruly, but at least at first. But once they are made to join in the fun at least a few times, they'll be as much as ours as any man ever was, which will get a lot more manpower. But these disgruntled soldiers will be most as professional and organized as part of the army, which hurts our organization, and a lifelong for the bandit, which we'll do later. And we can, of course, raid. Oh, boy. Uh, give it to the best. The best loot will go to the officers, such as only natural. They plan and live the raid, and their contentment is critical to the brigade's continued operations and spread the joy. The best loot will go to the soldiers instead. So, they took the greatest risk and fought on the front line against our enemies, and their satisfaction is critical to the brigade's uh, stability and enthusiasm. Just to make sure that the brig soldiers of the brigade are more happy, or the officers, so... It is what it is, but let's start with the next focus, our backs to the wall. These lands might belong to us, but not everyone accepts that. The Euro League, a pathetic collection of communities led by criminal priests, have hunted us time and again. And though we've evaded or destroyed their parties, more are always come. Otherwise, pinned between the madmen to the east, to the steps to the south, and the communes to the west, the League thinks they can destroy us once and for all. But what they don't know is that we have them right where we want them. We'll hold our own, bleed them dry, and then in some time, strike back and take Warnberg. And when we do, they will truly learn why the Brigade is so feared, which get 20% more stability by the lost son of Germany. Delvanga was deep in his cups when he was interrupted by some of his men barging into his tent. Before he could demand an explanation, they dragged forward a bloodied, tired, and emaciated boy no more than 15 years old. He'd been caught at the edge of the camp where the men had beaten him up until he surprised them all by crying out in fluent German. The boy feebly pleaded with Delvanga, introducing, introducing himself as Otto Wagner. He claimed to be the son of a settler family in Lex Commissariat Muscovy, where he'd been a petty thug. He and a group of fellow criminals had fled east after being caught fil filching weapons from the local garrison, but the wastes and the local hostels 
uh, hostile locals of the lands beyond German control had not been very kind of them. He was all that remained of that party, and he had been eventually found his way to Orsk after overhearing a group of militiamen talking about a group of German bandits based there. Whether out of genuine curiosity or simply thanks to being too drunk to care, Dolvanga decided not to spill the boy's guts to the dirt, remarking that he must be of fine area stock to have made it this far on his own. Dolvanga told the boy that he could stay within the camp, however. He grabbed the boy close and threatened him never to disrespect his new master. Otto quickly wiped his ears and then quietly thanked Dolvanga and bid a hasty exit from the tent. Cause no trouble, boy. Now, we do want to do a raid. Activate Pillage and Burn. But there's so many people around us. We have Orenburg, which... Yeah, it might be okay. Uh, the Euro League, which I'm pretty sure has mountains here. Yeah, mount fighting, attacking in a mountain is just a bad idea. Kostani? Kostani. Which probably would be the best, because this is, should be pretty deserty and plainsy. Ooh, attack is down, down by 10%. Minus 30% down here. It would still be probably 10%, right? Local province effects. Eh. Actually, this Toby is probably the best one to do. Those efforts armies are just too small to keep every town safe. We just can't pass this opportunity. That's probably for the best to try these guys first. So let's get down here first. Our divisions aren't great. Oscar, you need to be offensive. Uh, once we have, you know, command power too. We have two divisions of 12 combo with infantry, which sucks, with artillery. And then two divisions of 12 combo with militia with artillery. So I think we'll go with these guys first. These guys seem like the weakest. The Reich's last conquest and... Let's see what happens. Raid in 50 days. And we do have some manpower now. I want to get more organization. They're disorderly, and we don't want that. Distribute a little more equally. I like the war sport, but that's okay. I like the political power, because if you use a PP, you get worse organization, but you get more manpower. Hmm, it's a balancing act. But like I said earlier, I might have to use cons commands for this, so we'll see what happens, because this is not easy. And basically, actually, if I remember correctly, Dolvanga here is a disunifier. So he can... Kind of unite all of the Euros, I think, after what I've heard. I might be wrong about that, but we'll see what happens. We'll definitely see what happens. Backs, our backs to the walls. Um, we get rifles. How many more rifles do we need? We're actually looking really good on rifles in anti-tank. Look at that. So we don't really need any more. We need more army XP. That's what we could really use. And some more infantry divisions. Of course, we can't really make any more infantry divisions because we're out of manpower. Um... I want more manpower. We need more manpower, but I want to raise up our organization. We don't need more rifles. Uh, long life for the Black Bandit. A show of strength. PP is nice and all, but we don't really need it. But for now, let's just go ahead and read another focus. Uh, Borman's going to be the successor. We ride or die. I kind of don't mind that. But let's do this one first. Oh, what's oh, this? One? Any raids? Ooh, get more attack and defense. I like that. You never know if people are going to attack us immediately. Um, the soldiers of the brigade will be more content. Maybe more content. Let's do ride or die first. Surrounded by enemies, by those who would think to stop us or and or end our right to plunder. We refuse to die like they so desperately hope. We take, we ride. We ride over any foolish man enough to play soldier, and over any village fool enough to arm a militia, and over anyone else who dares to try and stop us. We'll find whatever, whomever they try to protect and load it up over the corpses. Get ready, boys. We ride for plunder. Yeah, I'm going to keep the PP for now. I mean, technically, yeah, we still have Warlord of Villain, and we can't get to the next stage, so we actually might as well do this. Um, this is actually not too bad, since we can't really, you know, do the other stuff. Uh, consumer goods, I mean, realistically, we're barely building roads here, so... Infrastructure would be nice, but I want to do something that gives us more manpower and or army XP. This is not bad, I like the weekly stability. Let's go ahead and train our troops, it's going to cost us a lot, but we'll get more manpower that way. Stability would be really good to get, I don't mind hurting our PP then. Abandoned the Nazi salute. Uh, it's been a long time now since we gloriously served the Fuhrer, but some ways of our former lives still remain in place. One of these has been the Nazi salute, often accompanied with the phrase, Seek Heil, of course. Ever since we were betrayed by our country, we have no Nazi party. The gestures instead migrated over as a mark of respect and loyalty to Dolvanga, particularly among the Germans in her hand, in her band. With growing numbers of non-Germans in the brigade, and the fact that we're no longer serving the Reich, a number of our boys are questioning why we should still do this gesture at all. Should we continue to promote its use or let it fall away? The salute is more of a mere gesture. We shall keep it. The cancerous host, a brilliant proposal. Or we are forging our own destiny without Germany. Ban and salute. I honestly prefer more stability maybe right now. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, it gives, technically, more stability gives you more organization. Slightly more political power. Construction speed output. So, as much as I love PP, we get basically one a day already. And we don't. I don't really want to use PP right now too much. Uh, that'd be good to have though. 
we shall keep it. It's more than a mere gesture. We're saluting to Delvanga, Oscar Delvanga. Gather our loot, prepare new raids. A lot of people think that the men of the brigade are simply simple bandits, capable of nothing more than simple brutality in the pursuit of plunder. Most of these people are dead. We may be brutal, but and we may want to loot, but we are no simpletons. Raids must be planned, loot must be transported, casualties must be managed, terror must be applied in the right fashion. Dolvanga and the Brigade at large have been doing this for years, and we will continue to do so as we prepare for the biggest raids yet. Uh, from Oh! Oh, they want to do it now. Um, if we attack... Um... Does this cancel if we do this? We're not going to give them anything. Actually, how much loot do we have? Do we see how much do we have? Maybe not. Um, can we let our, let our thing go first? No, let's, let's do it first. Let's see what happens. They're attacking us. Oh, they're going over there. The cancer cells. With every day in the chaotic Ural steps of the former Soviet Union, what had been once an SS brigade slipped further into simple brutality. Their morality eroded to cynical nihilism. One even Nietzsche would have raised an eyes eyebrows that no longer rooted to any ethical order but their own. Within this shaft lay a twisted birth, the mother being the sadistic joy of hearing lost souls begging for mercy as they were raped and tortured, the father still being the thrill of death knocking in one's door on a nearly daily basis. The endless violence that implanted in the brigade the idea to reject Nazism certainly a defiled, degenerate ideology, yet still with traditions that withheld certain desires and behaviors. Delvanga, despite having deep and even affectionate ties to the twisted ideology that had brought Germany to the heights he had exploited, felt his and his roots of the former SS members of the brigade slowly being replanted into the fertile grounds of the banditry of the non-German recruits. An unsurprising move to the alcoholic sexual deviant of the commander abolished or rather forgot the Sieg Heil, a greeting anonymous or synonymous with conformity and strict discipline. He was not a man that required the groveling, intricate power play of the fear, no, or were these the times of a settled, organized existence? These were the times of pleasure, fill, pillage. These were the times of death and glory. You cannot deny the nature of existence. Oh, content with Dolphin got slightly unorganized. The enemy is defeated, my friends. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Stability and political power. Good, good, good. Content, disorderly, so hopefully it's not too bad right now, but still. Alright. Delvanga, where did you go, my friend? That was actually really fast to get it done. Um... Do we... Oh, pillage and burn. There we go. Start a border war. Let's go in. Start immediately. I'm glad we did that, actually. Ah. The raid's been successful. So right now, the officers are content. It really looks like maybe we should... Hmm, if they're content, give to the best. We get some stability. But we lose political power and war support. We do the best. And the joy, we do... Well, we lose it anyways. We get war support for the soldiers of the brigade. The... The soldiers are slightly unorganized. Hmm. I don't know. I don't want rebellious officers. I don't want rebellious anybody, realistically. So... Oh, you're actually leading the thing yourself. Which is actually fine with me, so... Hopefully we can keep beating these people up. Um... I really don't know. I want to... I want to increase organization. I really do, but I want manpower, too. Random executions. We need manpower first. But... We get more political power by doing this stuff. This is this. We get manpower by doing that. We need more organization. The f officers will be more content. But there's nothing here for the soldiers being content. They're just slightly unorganized. So, you know, let's give it to the best. We'll see what happens. They're slightly content still. So now we're at 14. Food for the hungry? Very good. And now we can raid again. Oh, you know what? We'll do it again. Why not? Guess we're not going hungry tonight, which is good. Get a thousand more manpower? What happens if we choose this one? These disgruntled soldiers will be much less professional organized as part of the army. What if we click on that one? How bad is it going to get? Ride or die. Prepare new raids. Yes. And get a lot of manpower. And uh, the father followed up with... Ready the boys. Nobody in Russia on either side of the heroes is me meaner, tougher, stronger than the man of the brigade. The sound proved that once again. In order to provide motivation, some of the previous spoils will be spread around. Loot, liquor, and the provision of women who are still capable of providing entertainment will remind them of what's to come. Our next expedition is fast approaching, and they must be enthusiastic for it. A moment to reflect. Though his life was a near constant haze of devilish excitement and all manner debauchery, for once Vilvanga had found a moment of relative quiet alone in his tent. With little to do, his eyes scanned the space for something to occupy himself with, and when his gaze fell upon his trusty rifle, it's an ancient thing, really. 
a standard issue Carabiner 98K, one he'd owned since his days stolen the Reich's leash. Yet despite his men continually acquiring new weapons in their bloody rage, he'd kept it and maintained his rifle all these years, and continued to use it to be to deadly effect. Sitting down with it on the dirty fur mask he used for a bed, he began carefully polishing the grime off its worn surface. As he worked, his mind wandered backwards in time. He traced through a rusty trigger, and remembered how his finger had clicked, clicked, clicked in the faces of Spado's traitor's men, blowing their empty skulls open across the Russian snow. He polished the barrel and smirked as he thought back to when his men had first arrived in Orsk, when he thrust it down the throat of the last mayor of the city and almost choked him to death before shredding his innards with a bullet. His fingers rubbed over the scratches on the stock, and he laughed at all the Russian peasants he had simply beaten to bloody pulp with it. He held the now relatively clean weapon in front of him to him, beholding this rifle was looking like in a mirror. It had been with him for as long as he remembered. This is why he kept it with him at all this time. It was part of him. To think a thing so deadly can be so beautiful. Hmm. The coffee I have is pretty good. Officers receive majority, officers equally. Hmm. We just need more men. Oh, they're still disorderly, which makes sense, but still. I prepare any raids. And ready the boys, my friends. Ready the boys. Ah, oh, muddy matter. As the raiding party sat down to rest in the buried, or burned remains of the latest village to face their wrath, Delvanga hopped out of his truck and went to get something from the back. As he approached, he noticed that the mud from the recent rains now caked the sides of the vehicle. He looked around the village for some use of sought to foister the responsibility of cleaning up the vehicle upon, when he found a group of his men roasting the village animals over a fire. His gaze honed in on one particular man who had most displeased him, a Kazakh raider, one who had joined the band recently but had constantly hung his back in the raids, keeping himself out of danger yet still happily helping himself to the loot afterwards. Delvanga calmly ordered the man to approach. He smiled and offered him a cloth and bucket and ordered him to have his truck spotless within the hour. The coward's face immediately went white, and Delvanga's smile grew all the wider. A few of the other men present, present began to cackle the man, who immediately set to furiously scrubbing the mud off the weather-beaten metal. Delvanga chuckled and wandered off into the village to find loot or some captives to entertain himself with, leaving the man to work like his life depended upon it. And actually, his life does depend upon it. And let's keep them fresh. The men of the Brigade are hard, but gorging and plunder, that ever-present goal has had a disturbing tendency to turn them soft. A lazy bandit is a dead bandit, and we have no intention of dying. We'll keep their beds hard, their barracks barely warm enough, and their liquor share sufficient. But only just, we'll keep them alert. Alert enough so that when the command is given, they will largely and eagerly jump for the chance to participate in another expedition, but a spot of bother. The man waited nervously as Dolvanga examined every inch of the truck. The sides were now completely free of mud. The dust had been polished off the wide screen, or windscreen, and even the interior had been cleaned of grime. Dolvanga checked it all over, once, twice, three times. Finally, he approached the man and thanked him for making his truck cleaner than it had been in a long, long time. Of course I said I want it spotless, he said. That insidious grin returning to his face. The blood left the raider's face once more as Dolvanga knelt down and beckoned him to come and look. There, just on the underside of the front left fender was a tiny leftover spot of mud. A single saw was all that had, had time to leave the man's throat before Dolvanga put his rifle to the back of his head and pulled the trigger. The other men watched it laughed. Watching laughed as the two approached to dump the raider's body with the others. After watching the wretched core go, Dolvanga turned back to his vehicle only to groan with frustration at the sight of all the blood now spattered over the door. He turned to the man who had spilled booze over him the other day and barked at him to get the mess cleaned up. The same rules applied, as always. That's the third time this month. What is but one man? Pillage of lands? This stuff, we don't need to do that one. No. We gotta save the men. Seven divisions in Olsk. Show of strength. That'd be really nice to do. Um, we'll probably save repeat to get more soldiers, too. So, uh, I really want to go random executions. And this one, too. Ah, oh, get to 7,500 would be really good. Organization would go up by two levels. If we got rid of this, how much does this... How much manpower is this? 6,300. If we cancel this, we can go up another level. Oh, that's not bad. I'm gonna try it. Instituting draconian punishments for even the smallest infraction should de demonstrate to our men that dissent will not be tolerated. Loyalty is mandatory. Nice. And since we have the manpower now... Actually, we can do both, can't we? Random executions. Selecting a number of the less important soldiers of the brigade for random summary execution should remind the others of the life they now live, and the loyalty they now eternally demanded. I want to save that for now. We always have that in reserve. So let's spend the manpower here and do it like that first. Um, not much is happening here, so we'll get this one done. And then ready to the boys, and then keep them fresh. Yes, yeah, so I love fresh boys. Hmm. Um, weekly stability, not going to do that one. This one's not too bad. We have enough, oh yeah, we're out of factory slots. Infrastructure's not bad, but we're already building infrastructure, technically, so. Prepare, prepare a raid. Oh, yes, please. Asuka, yes. Pillage and burn? Let's see what happens. 
We should do okay here, right? I mean, it is Delvanga, right? Oh, yes! Break them! Ah, raid has been successful. We'll do it again, because I love... I love this group. I love it, love it, love it, love this group so much. And he's, and he's really good on attack, so... Ready the boys! Nothing like a good bunch of fresh boys. Food for the hungry. Ah, yes. Stability and war support? Yes, please! Hmm. Nah, nothing there I really care about. Keep them happy, though. The brigade exists because of enjoyment. Enjoyment of using that which was taken by force of arms from the cold, dead hands of weaker men. What that is, wine, women, drugs, games, books, or anything else at all, doesn't matter. The boss knows this very well, and so loot will be distributed and revelry encouraged. A happy bandit is always motivated to arrange so, and will cheerfully obey any orders given in that pursuit. Oh, civil rights in America. Ah, what a trifle of a thing. Uh, now soldiers are now well organized. I don't know what the max level is here, though. Because new raid preparation's nice. Uh, the content. And, uh, we still have disorderly. Oh, wait, what? The oldest of us has died. We have a few ties for Homa and back when we were a mere SS division. Aside from some uniforms, flags, and general memorabilia, the largest of these connections from the, are the original German members of the brigade who have always held a special place for Delvanga. Yet our oldest member, Karl Wilhelm Müller, had died at the age of 73. Suffering from ailing health for the last few years, he suffered a stroke in camp two days ago which proved to be the last that he could take, following a passing away this morning. The loss is being felt hard by the other members of the old god in the band, but more importantly, is, be is beginning to raise questions about what exactly will happen if old age becomes brave enough to come after our Delvanga. Rest in peace, my friend. So, what do you mean by well organized? Why is it so disorderly? Oh, can we. Okay. Uh, uh, at the end of every month, they might. Okay, they're content. New rate preparations, and now we're organized. We actually basically got 10% more organization, tech, and defense, so that's actually really good. That's very, very good. I like that a lot. So, we don't need to do this one yet. Um, I want to. Because the soldiers are well organized, I want the officers to be very happy with us. So. We could do that. Why not? Let's do that. Why not? Probably have to balance this. Spread the joy. An ultimatum from Kostene. This is October. Ah, it's not right here. You dare question Delvenga? Actually, let's grab someone else that was better on defense. There you go. Ah, do you have anything else here? Scavenger. Let's go scavenger. I like scavenger. Spread the joy. I mean, we might as well, right? We lose some political power. We, get, we lose some war sport. Oh, wait. For 60 days, we get that war sport back. Probably? Maybe not? The soldiers will be more happy. Uh, maybe we should wait. Maybe we should wait. Let's wait. Keep them fresh and young? Mm, not about that. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. You stupid horse boys. And prepare for the clash. Oh, look at that. The enemy's defeated. Good. It's coming in soon. A big showdown with the EuroLeague is approaching, and we're going to have to destroy them. We're going to kill their men, rape Orenberg into the ground in every way possible, and prove to everyone that nobody can stop the brigade. And after that, without the League around to organize defenses and provide advisors to villages, well, we'll loot the whole region. Who could stop us? Unnecessary compensation. Delvanga woke up cold, sweaty, and disoriented. It had certainly not been the worst dream, but definitely the one he liked the least in a while. He'd been mocked by the highest ranking officers for not having a car suited to his position as leader. He was embarrassed, and he felt powerless. In between the regular raids and fun games, Delvanga had many quick passing periods to think about the situ solution to such a problem. It was during one of those passing periods that came to him he had he had the solution. Delvanga would authorize the creation of a truck grand and powerful on a level suited to him. Named after its inventor, the Oskarwagen would become a motorized arsenal of fear and firepower with a large cannon, big enough to turn a farm into a forest of wood splinters. When such divine inspiration hit Delvanga, he knew he had to act. Immediately, he ordered four of his burliest brutes to mount the largest gun in the stockpile atop his truck. Delvanga waited with eagerness to see the results of his illustrious idea, almost enough to turn his attention away from the execution of a few peasants. On his latest raid, the Oscar Wagon will ride. That's actually really cool. Oscar Wagon. Hmm. The Os Delvanga Oscar Wagon Brigade. Cool. Right now, I've, already, I've literally just went ahead and raided these guys. These guys died very quickly. And I'm thinking about making 20 combo with infantry. Um, we need artillery. That's probably the biggest thing. Relics of the past. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, we can do some artillery. Shea uh, Guevara released. All right, then. And we got to prepare for the clash, but gather our loot. When the brigade rides, it always returns with mountains of loot. Oh, a semi. Look at that. But it also returns with problems of keeping track of that loot. Shears must be properly distributed, and even with the penalty known, some men always try to take more. This cannot be allowed to continue. Every man gets a share, and the size of that share depends on many things. An inventory of all spoils must be meticulously generated, kept, and regularly updated. After all, how else will we know when it's time to go and take more? 
the head count. In a fit of rage at Manta Shop how surprised the entire brigade, Oscar Delvang had called for such a systematic headcount of every soldier, brigand, and br bandit under his command. While well, such a synthesis had been attempted two years before, it had resulted in completely useless data, the brigade's men seemingly too erratic to be tracked down with mere numbers. Despite this previous failure, Delvang has doubled down when he was questioned by some brave souls, and with a low growl exclaimed, If you won't count them, then I'll shoot every last one of my men and count your corpses myself. This level of urgency had never marked previous headcounts, and almost every bandit had his own personal speculation on why the count was being carried out. The leader himself wouldn't give any answer more solid than just calling it a hunch, which is not making the few soldiers with administrative skills any more confident about the necessity of all this. However, the one thing they feared more than dull bureaucratic work is the wrath of the bandit king, and while everyone might drag their feet, the headcount will nonetheless be carried out soon. It remains to be seen if Delvanga's peculiar hunch carries any weight. Might as well have a census of rabbit dogs? Might as well. Also, we do this again. We get political power. Um, I want to make them really happy. I want the officers to be happy, so do that one first. And actually, yeah, well, they're still well organized, which is great. So we could get more manpower and for 50 political power, but they're going to be less organized, less powerful. So yeah. And to do this, you need 7,500. And that's getting more stability is nice and all, but it's not really necessary. So we're actually at a really good point here. Um, let's grab some more stability, actually. Actually, we're, ooh, we're maxed out on some of the stuff here. I'm not exactly sure, because we have more than 80% poverty rate. We have elite-only education, no health care, no voting. No, uh, we allow slavery, illegal trade unions, state atheism, two-year draft, no unemployment subsidies. We might already be at the max for this already. So, um, 25 political power. 300 missing men. Oh, boy. Oh, that is not good. But, you know, we'll try this for the last time. If we're already maxed out, we'll try this one for the last time. Secure control. The head count came up through to short. Even accounting for administrative incompetencies, or incompetence, desertions, routine disappearances, and bear attacks, stray German bombs, communist raids, executions, poxes, frostbite, trips, falls, suicides, bonfire, accidents, sleuth disputes, and the common cold, black flu, uh, black plague, flu, food poisoning, alcohol poisoning, regular poisoning, irregular poisoning, assassination, STDs, heat stroke, hypothermia, rockside, scientific, or scientific, science experiments gone wrong, science experiments gone to plan, kidnapping, dog attacks, rabies, aggressive reindeer, uh, raid casualties, Gambling arguments, race wars, building collapses, spontaneous combustion, vehicle collisions, shooting competition, misfires, targeting practice, infected wounds, occasional killing on accident, the much more common killing for fun, stabbing, shootings, prussian, cavalry, saber rampages, cray crushings, lynchings, brain aneurysms, slave revolts, dueling in the general inability for most bandits in the brigade to count past the number of years they've lived. This statistic is star still far out of the ordinary. We'll have to investigate it and find the missing men as soon as possible. Bring them to me dead or alive, preferably alive, and prepare for the spoils. Though it cannot be truly considered a problem, we frequently find that we have trouble storing all the spoils of our many successes and successful raids. This causes trouble without proper places to store everything we've taken. Not only do we need to rapidly distribute and co or consume it, which causes discipline problems, but we find that thievery increases besides. Therefore, more depots will be constructed before our next raid. Hopefully, they'll fill up just as quickly. The secretary, nearly half a year after Otto Wagner arrived in this camp, he has slowly integrated into life in the brigade. He does not complain or talk much, even as the older men roughhouse him around and give him the occasional beating. After all, he does not have any elsewhere to go or to be. So for the most part, he puts up with getting the scraps from the table and generally being the run to the brigade. Recently, Dovanga has become tired of managing the day-to-day -day humdrum of loot distribution and ammo management. He's decided he would much like a secretary, like the big bosses back in Germany would have, to handle all the boring, tenuous, or tedious work while they could spend their time out of cracking skulls. Perhaps seeking to finally give Otto some purpose, he un unceremoniously dumped a pile of ledgers and notebooks in his hands and told him to get to work. Not daring to disrespect Oscar Delvanga, the new secretary quickly took to his duties. Satisfied with what the boy was no longer sitting around uselessly, Delvanga looked for some more depraved activities to involve himself in, now that his responsibilities have been delegated away. Don't screw this up or you'll know what's coming. Love it. That's what I kind of did with my, with, on my Discord server. But, I mean, we're not beating the scribes, but... I wonder if they're watching. Hey, scribes, if you're watching, please let me know. <laughs> cool. Um, not bad. It is ready. Or, yeah, it is ready. After quite a while, certainly not longer than Dolvanga would have liked or demanded, spent forging the masterpiece, the Oscar Wagon was completed. A true beauty, a proper front piece for the brigade. It would serve its purposes exactly. Dolvanga made it mandatory for all of the men not currently pillaging to attend the demonstration and first test the vehicle. It was a surprise to the men of the camp to find Dolvanga excited about something that wasn't completely morally bankrupt, and most didn't know quite how to feel about it, but eventually the black band found themselves just as excited as nervous for the unveiling of the great Oscar Wagen that had seen so much hype from our leader. Dolvanga had mandated a few old broken up vehicles to be set up as target for the gun, and it was much tension that he had personally ordered the firing of the cannon. Boom, baby, boom. 
And we've got to wait to blow things up, gather loot, and prepare for the spoils of Asuka Wagen. The cheers from the grade were loud, only to be deafened by the violent cannon shot. It worked. Delvanga was delighted, pleased that he finally had a vehicle. Oh, look at that. He could take charge from and lead great conquest from wherever he wanted. The mountain, of course, the so-called great city Orenburg and the glorified prisoners will stand no match against a new engine of war. Dolvanga was so pleased that upon seeing the success of the first Oscar wagon, he ordered another one to act as a backup and another fine engine of destruction to reinforce his brigade. The pleased attitude spread amongst all present. With that successful test under his belt, Oscar D Dolvanga demanded to lead the next raid. He would personally fire the cannon as much as possible. Dolvanga could hardly wait for the construction of the second Oscar wagon. Of course it worked, and this, of course, I said it before, as the destruction of the Swaska in May of eight, 1945... Uh, on the Reichstag or something like that, but of course it worked. 50 raiders found. The search for the missing men had turned up something useful once more, as 50 more brigands were discovered in Kazakhstan. It seems that these had no, these ones had no intention to desert, or were simply out raiding when the headcount was taken. They've been tracking a caravan of Kazakh villagers, who had led them to a nearly undefended, bountiful town. They had gained considerable spoils and captives in the cruel ransacking, a little celebrating until the search party turned up was therefore not entirely unreasonable. When they were ordered to return back to the brigade, no complaints were noted at first. However, it soon became clear that they had intended to keep all their loot to themselves. This led to heated arguments on the way home, and even a rather wasteful amount of bloodshed. Upon their return, Delvango was dutifully informed of their ill intentions, his fury barely containable. He demanded they turn over the proper share as usual, and in an unusually brazen act of defiance, they refused right to, to his madness contorted face. The cracking mask of humanity finally peeled entirely to reveal a seething insanity as he ordered all of them to be executed as traitors and their loot turned over to him personally. The scene afterwards was brutal and ended with all defiant banners mutilated to the point where even their mothers would have not recognized them. Looks like the headcount will stay 50 short. You don't mess with Asuka. Asuka Delvanga gives. And he takes. As is appropriate. I want more attack and defense. I want more. More. Prepare the spoils. The Black Bandit on the Black Mountain. Even for the men of the brigade, rumors about the insane experiments conducted by the mad scientist in Magnitogorsk are enough to give pause, but the boss seems only, or sees only opportunity. Whatever else he might be, Lysenko is certainly no friend of the Euro League, and he has large deposits of weapons of all kinds. Weapons we want, and we'll try to work out a deal for some of them. And in time, we can look into what else he might have have. With mutual enemies in the region, we shall send a delegation to the Black Mountain at Lysenko's invitation. 130 more men were found. After a long days of searching paths without results, a large group of uh, amounting to just short of half of the missing men has been found on the outskirts of the brigade's area of terror. This group was found camping in a village they'd recently sacked, picking through the remains and performing the usual unspeakable cruelties on those they captured upon being questioned by the search party. The perplexed soldiers and leaders among them claimed it had just been a routine raid, but after the most basic of investigations, it became obvious that they were trying to conceal what they gained and not give the usual cut to Delvanga. Trying to cut a profit without including the bandit king, a grave, grave mistake. This obviously could not stand. Bruised and bloody, they were dragged screaming all the way back to Delvanga himself, and not only were they forced to give up the entirety of their earnings, they were required to beg for mercy personally. The mad Württemberger went down the entire line of the quivering 130 men, listening to the sobbing and pleading, executing a few seemingly at random until it reached the end. Those would-be deserters better had learned their lesson. That'll show them. To each according to his ability. One of the men who had accompanied our latest raids has found himself before Delvanga himself today. As a disagreement between uh, he and his commanding officer had gained notoriety within the camp, the soldier has made the audacious claim that he is not being provided with enough for all that he does for the raids, and that those who plunder the most should henceforth receive the most. He continues on to claim that the officer refuses to provide the men their fair share, and brazenly states that the officer's own contributions pale in comparison to his, something not represented in his rewards. Not willing to let his arguments be dismissed, the soldier produces a small sack of evidence. Evidence. The bag of evidence produces a foul smelling that, upon opening, was revealed to be quite a brutal bounty. Inside laid at least a dozen pairs of strung together ears, one the soldier claimed to have removed from his victims during the raiding. raiding. The soldier continued to rant about how this was proof enough that he deserved far more loot than he was given, and that he demanded rewards to match his far superior contributions to his cause. All eyes were on Dole then to set the precedent for the future. Shoot this punk, find his officer? Yes, kill him, but look into the evidence. A Bolshevik battalion. Dazzling incompetence. I did notice this. They were loyal to Dilvanga. But now the soldiers are slightly unorganized, which I do not like. Oh, they're, just, they're respecting us. It doesn't really help us that much, I'll be honest. I want to make sure that these soldiers are okay. Distribute loot more equally. Um, how can we improve the situation with these guys? We're spreading the joy, so that'd be good anyways. Shoot this punk, find his officer. Hmm. Undo the Bolshevik battalion. Are we actually losing here? We didn't let time go on fast enough, so. 
Um, we have enough PP though. Ah, very good. We lose a few men here and there, but that's okay. All right, not bad. Actually, how much more manpower do they have? Because we could probably end up killing up every single person here, maybe. Oh, never mind. Fifty-two thousand is quite a few. All right. Ah, yes. Do it again. Again and again and again and again. And when you're done, do it again. Treasure. Ah, oh, yes. Political power that we don't really need. Can't we do this one, too? A Bolshevik battalion. After the execution of the Bolshevik soldier who caused a ruckus among the brigade, a decision was made to posthumously look into his evidence to see if his words had any merit, even after death. A subsequent investigation into these matters revealed a highly disturbing trend that did not simply die with the man, but one that had infected many of those who sat in the man's division. Within the battalion, the now dead soldier now lied a disturbing, perhaps even communist sentiment. While that man yet lived, his ideas of spreading the plunder far more equally per permeated many of the soldiers he fought alongside. And investigative actions revealed the communist despicable Bolshevik. Bolshevik, downright opposite to moral, moral or morale, moral ideas that maybe the soldiers should receive a greater share of what they manually loot and steal for themselves. Of course, this trend is downright alarming, if not completely sinister in nature. Alas, with the circumstances, one is led to wonder why the officers of this battalion did not find it prudent to clamp down on such ideas, especially with the relative ease of which these Red Russian ideas were discovered. Two of courses of action seem equally appropriate in the response, of course. A simple solution would be to remove this radical Marxist thought with the cracks of a rifle, but that could be viewed as a waste of manpower and ammo. It may be equally advisable to find out why exactly the officers have not already taken care of this, and perhaps find the source of the problem. Gun down these fools? Or... Oh, Secret Red. Just who is in command here? Let's do that one. I want to know. Mm -hmm. We know more things about loot here, which kind of sucks. We'll do that one first. Because we get more ore support, but uh, I want them to get, these guys to get higher here. Followed up with what? Instruction? Delvenga is still alive. Land auction? Um, I definitely... I just want more Artie. That's all I want. All I want is Artie. We get a lot of political power, but I don't really care about political power. Anti-tank, research speed, strike of the peasantry, Orenburg, uh, the lower organization. Ah, uh, let's use goes instruction. The deal with Lysenko has worked out even better than we could have hoped. Not only did he have weapons, but among the NKVD soldiers who defected to him, there were several actual combat instructors. The men of the brigade may be expert raiders with an eye for the value of anything encountered by many of them, especially our newer recruits, are woefully undertrained. We've therefore worked out an arrangement to send some of our people to go and learn some basic military particulars from these instructors. Let's see how much the League likes it when we run next into them. You know what? Since we're here, um, let's invest in infrastructure, because we can. Might as well. We get even more manpower that way, which would be nice, but so close. Twenty more of the men who are missing from the head count have finally been found over the course of many different individual findings. These were the ones who deserted or joined other lesser banded groups. As some of these groups were destroyed or absorbed into Dilvanga's brigade, the missing men were rediscovered and given appropriate punishments for desertion. Some of these men have been missing for years, and the fact that they were found by complete and utter luck shows that it's likely that many of these men missing from the headcount simply deserted, and that a few might not ever be found. Some already might be hundreds or thousands of miles away, having raided or migrated to other regions of chaotic Russia. However, we still managed to find these men who had been missing for so long, and that on its own still qualifies as an accomplishment. Finally got you in a streak of red. The decision to interrogate the officers of the newly discovered Bolshevik battalion proved it to be wise, if only because it produced a harrowing discovery. When the officers were isolated and asked about the disconcerting ideas of their men, the officers eventually let it slip that even they some somewhat take the ideas of the men into account. Even worse, the officers claimed that such ideas were not isolated to a single battalion of the Dolvanga Brigade, but are in quite fact common among the Dolvanga's entire army. The officers go so far as to claim that it's only the top echelons, Dolvanga and his closest generals, that believe that the officers should be taking most of the spoils for themselves. Confronted with such radical, absurd ideas, Oscar is left to wonder if this is all an audacious ploy to make these dissident ideas seem far more spread than they really are, or if this is a real problem that has found itself slithering among the minds what used to be such a brutal, compliant pillagers. After all, such a bluff could be a Bolshevik plot to force Dolvanga to accept such ideas, when they do not have precedence in reality. On the other hand, the traitor officers could unfortunately be correct, which may place the entire future of the Dolvanga Brigade in jeopardy. At the Dolvanga Brigade is to continue its existence. A decision will have to be made to prevent the extremist ideas of looting sharing from spreading. Dolvanga is left to make the decision on the next move, of course, after splattering these officers' heads on the ground. And I will save in front of you guys just in case, just because I hear that Dolvanga has many ways he could die, so. Hunt these reds down. This is absurd. They lie. Um, let's do that one. 
a black bandit on the Black Mountain. Twenty years ago, not even madmen would have told us that Oscar Delvanga and Trofim Denovich, Lysenko, would ever meet as allies. Yet today, history has been written which will surely shape the future of the Russian landscape. Today, exactly 8 zero eight o'clock, the man, or the black bandit, arrived with 30 of his best men at Lysenko's compound upon Black Mountain, bringing with him 20 of the choicest prisoners taken in our most recent raids, including a famous Soviet singer, as gifts for the mad scientist. The meeting was far from typical meeting held between the leaders. Lavish dinners exchanged for much more practical uses of time. Upon Dovanga's arrival, he joined Lysenko to inspect the 22nd Motor Rifle Division, NKVD, followed by a tour of Black Mountain's defensible positions. More excitingly, this was followed by a tour of several of Lysenko's laboratories and demonstrations of technology and techniques. One experiment demonstrated upon a young Polish woman brought particular delight from the Black Bandit. Finally, the day was concluded with a three-hour meeting between Dovanga, Lysenko, and their respective translators. The two men appeared to have taken a quick liking to each other, and the agreements between our forces and these both to finally destroy the Euro League has progressed significantly, for simply handing over the population we seize after our inevitable victory, which will gain a pick of the countless technologi technological marbles Black Mountain has hidden within for so long. The Montagues and Capulets unite at last. Expert instruction. The Soviets might have lost their grand war against the Reich, but those of us still around from those times will remember how hard they fought and how many Germans they killed before capitulating. They accomplished this through tough, uncompromising, and sometimes brutal training, training that we now have access to, courtesy of Lysenko's instructors. And we intend to exploit it. As many of our best as many of our men as possible will be sent to hopefully learn better and more efficient tactics. If those tactics lead to more successful raids, so much the better. Weapon inspections. The village was a blazing inferno. Men fled and children screamed helplessly and the foul odor of death permeated throughout the fallen per paradise. The former citizenry, regardless of age or circumstance, were mercilessly butchered by the warriors of darkness. Their corpses searched thoroughly for items of wealth prior to the carelessness or careless discardment in ashes of what was once home. The raid had been overwhelmingly successful, and as the deranged warriors began to indulge themselves in the fruits of their labor, further horrendous and unspeakable acts of degeneracy occurred against the deceased. Hours following the orgy of violence, the fatigued warriors rested at the village entrance, emotionally and mentally exhausted from the bl day's bloodshed and degeneracy. By nightfall, an odd serenity filled the air. Peace reigned at last, however. The silence of the night was shattered as a warrior's commander arrived at the former village as Obafia Dovanga approached the resting man. His deranged face illuminated by torchlight, he let a blood-curdling scream, causing his men to suddenly wake. As he stumbled to their feet, the Obafia declared it was time for the weapons inspection. The shocked and fatigued men were quickly shuffling into place as the inspection commenced. The Obafia went man by man, displeased, inspecting the weaponry, continually hurling abuse at his loyal warriors. The soldiers stood there petrified beyond relief, belief, as Dovanga would stand in sudden observation. After minutes of contemplation, he raised his right hand and selected several soldiers from the line. From the curtain of the darkness, a firing squad emerged who mechanically raised their weapons and aimed to slaughter the chosen men. Yet, despite this, Obafira wasn't satisfied yet. He called over the raid commander and his subordinate and exchanged brief but tense words as Dilvanga questioned the men. Despite the fact that both men possessed significant talent, Dilvanga pondered about executing both of them to serve a further example to those spared in the previous executions. Kill them as well? Have mercy upon them, they have done no harm. I kind of want to kill them anyways. But have mercy for now. It can be better used later on, maybe. That's kind of fun, fun episode so far. Going a little crazy. Uh, more rating would be nice, especially if it gets us one group here. Has Burgundy finally done it? Well, maybe. Oh, Pillage of the Land. That's not worth it, man. We have more than enough rifles. I, like I said, we just need more arty. I really, really want more arty. Uh, the Quietus of Supremacism. They set upon the manor at midnight, paying no attention to stealth as they shattered their edifice's stained windows, the only goal in mind to execute the refugees hiding inside and the lone Soviet general which held the estate. As they pillaged every chamber, the substantial art collection they held was treated with utter indifference by the drunken raiders, smashing work after work with no restraint. But for a moment, the decimation ceased as they saw an elderly man standing in front of one painting, sobbing and pleading for its mercy. Oh, dude, what is this? Oscar balked in confusion. The man collapsed onto his knees, begging for his father's magnum opus to be spared. The band looked upon the abstract, meaningless composition, their faces sneering with disgust. It's just a bad word, Black Square. A br brigadier howled, prompting a voracious laughter. They readied their rifles and began to volley hundreds of rounds towards the man, and the degenerate art shredding his paint and tearing its linen. The rampage soon continued until they ended with, with a lit match. As the mansion went up in flames, one of the soldiers saw something in smoke, something that appeared to distinguish itself powerfully from the rest, an apparition that contrasted with the sky so severely that it was impossible for a more perfect, more supreme polarity to ever be imagined. When he turned around, it was gone. The dream realm of the avant-garde has faded away. Only reality remains. Farewell to the liberty nothing. A fight gone horribly right. The brave fighting man of the Dovanga Brigade will always find some reason to celebrate. A successful raid, a comrade's birth, the anniversary of some previous victory. Tuesday, whatever excuse they can find, and those celebrations always involve copious amounts of vodka. Another celebration was held today, this time for a squad's successful shakedown of the local farm for a month's worth of grain and potatoes. Plus a sliver, a silver picture, frame, and a gold belt knuckle. 
Bu belt buckle. As always, things began to spiral out of control. Ribald jokes about other bandits' endowment and the friendliness of their mothers were taken seriously, and soon a brawl broke out as the two bandits rolled around in the mud, drunkenly screaming obscenities and threats at one another. They quickly became the spectacle for all their fellow soldiers that evening. Suddenly, a gunshot rang cut throughout the night, bringing the revelry to a sudden halt. One of the fighters knelt on the ground, staring dumbfounded that Nagant revolver had somehow made its way into his hand. His opponent was lying face down, a trickle of blood running out of his mouth. The surviving fighter staggered up upright and protruded his unfortunate rival with a toe of his boot, slurring, Vanya, you all right? You need to sleep it off? Receiving no answer, he stumbled away and sat back down to the table, returning to his friends in the bottle vodka that were there before he was so rudely interrupted. He's just snapping, right? Oh, we can make some Panzer Division, but we have no tanks. Motorized divisions, but we have no trucks. So, yeah, not good. I do want to make these guys slightly bigger, so we can do something like that, maybe? That'd be kind of nice. Anything else? Military government in the Gulf. A black and red brigade. Oh, they're still content. They're only content with us. That kind of sucks. Oh, they're respecting us for now, but we need to improve their uh, disposition towards us, so. Um, we can do that. Why not? Once again, it was wise to look deeper into the post-mortem characteristic of our men. To our detriment, it seemed that the officers did not lie at all about the presence of foul communists in our ranks. And their extent has reached a point where Delvang and his loyal generals cannot simply gun down every single transgressor without mercy. It is a common dreadful sentiment amongst a majority of our men that loot should be shared to the individual achievement of the raiders. And that sentiment is a firm belief in the hearts of our men. The shock and rage present in Delvang is palpable, and the only thing stopping him from going on a killing spree is the necessity of manpower for his grand plans to loot and plunder beyond every single square inch of the southern Urals and beyond. Lamentably. This means that Delvanga is faced with two options to continue the further existence of this brigade, of course. He can step away from the investigation and pretend that he never found out about such contemptible ideas present in his men. Then, there is the second option, a step into darkness that seems to have fallen over all of his men. Perhaps stability would be easiestly be found if Delvanga took some of their ideas into account. While utterly vile, it would be likely to produce an increase in morale in the men, something that may improve effectiveness for our great conquest. It is simply deplorable that the men have found idiotic minds of their own, but yet Delvanga stands forced to take into account the wishes of band of executioners. We can listen just for morale. No. We put it into this FOSS immediately. Uh, because of that, I do want to make these guys as fast as possible. We will not have enough artillery to get these guys out anyway, so just do that. There you go. We need six division, seven divisions anyway, so give it a day and we'll run out of manpower. There you go. Nice. Very good. Grab the healthy, fit, and strong. We like them healthy, fit, and strong. Um, pillage and... Oh, yes, please. We have a village to pillage, my friends. And pillage we will. The initial defenses will be strong, but once we crack through them, they will be nothing. Absolutely nothing. Oh, raiding? Uh, do it again. Because they're so easy to raid, you might as well keep doing them. Well, organize and content. Relics of the past. Good. Distribute loot more equally. Well, I mean, they're, they're kind of okay with us for now, so we're not going to do that yet. Uh, people still might raid us, though, but we gotta keep an eye on that. And machines of the past. Hey, another Soviet instability. Soviet stratagems. Hmm, we'll do that one. Why not? The Soviets lost, but as the Russian members of the brigade make sure to constantly emphasize, they were in our masters of deception of the Maskerovka. They used that mastery many years ago to sow confusion among both the Wehrmacht and their other enemies. Our enemies are smaller than the Soviets were, but they are still enemies all the same. If we can learn some of these strategies of the deception, modify them to suit our purposes, and deploy them on our next raid, we can increase effectiveness significantly. Or at the very least, give them less time to hide their valuables. The Call of the Wild. The raiding squad rides across the hills in such a plunder, no doubt imagining themselves to be similar to the Mongol hordes of old. The target is a village of Russian peasants just over the next ridge, having survived through sheer luck and oversight on the brigade's part until now. They have little in ways of pure wealth, and they always have a full cellars, plenty of vodka, and the occasional silver candlestick of gold ring de boot. It's a loot. All in all, the best pickings a raider could hope for without having to brave arm resistance. Suddenly, the squad comes to a halt as their leader's signal. He suddenly points to a shallow ravine as the men gaze in awe. There, staring at them, is an adult brown bear in the middle of hunting for dinner. The men are frozen, desperately hoping not to break the uneasy silence between them and the beast. Finally, the commander leans over to his second in command and whispers, I'll go up to it. His aide stares at him like he's grown a second head, and then chambers around in the war and Mosin got in his hands. Better put the beast down before his boss gets any more stupid ideas. Better safe than sorry. Maybe it's friendly? Um, yeah, maybe it's friendly. That's a stu really stupid to do, but whatever. Uh, they're still content, right? Oh, they're slightly unorganized, too, so... Give it to the best. Um, I do want to get more men. And I do need to raise this up a little bit more. So, yeah. 
First contact. The uh, commander reaches out his hand to his side, keeping his aide's rifles pointed to the ground without breaking eye contact with the bear. With an empty hand held forward, he slowly starts inching towards the bear, or the beast, ready to break in a run at the first sign of trouble. The bear, meanwhile, stares at him with dark eyes, nothing in his movements or expression betraying what it may do next. After what feels like an eternity, the commander is standing several feet in front of the bear, which is standing as still as a statue. He reaches the quivering arm outward, and after a moment of hesitation, gently brushes it on top of the bear's muzzle. Is he mad? Yes, he is. We need 3,000. We need even more than that. We don't need any more. Uh, worst part's not bad. Ah, we'll do it once, why not? How to train your Ursaid. Ursaid. It is a tense moment, but the commander leaving his head planted on the bear's face, and nobody dares to breathe even for fear of the angering the beast. But eventually, the bear leans forward and starts nuzzling the commander's hem. The men are to stare dumbfounded as the leader begins petting the bear's head with both hands while it scratches the side of its head against his uniform jacket. As a test, the commander takes a step back and the bear steps forward to stay by his side. He hops on his horse and the bear eagerly slumbers alongside him. I guess it is friendly after all. As they arrive back at the camp with a new friend, the rest of the bandits and soldiers laugh hysterically at the sight of a bear padding along like a loyal pet dog that night after some discussion with his men and copious amounts of vodka. The commander decides that he should try climbing on the bear's back and riding it like a horse. It took several attempts, but the commander eventually managed to stay on the beast's back without being thrown off. He laughed at the sheer ridiculousness of it all with his men, and it only provoked further roars of laughter when he promises he'll ride at the next raid. That's a good one. He's serious, isn't he? Immediate regret. Oh, don't give us immediate regret. I want to see what happens. Uh, the content. Uh, ooh, I don't know about that. The Charge of the Bear Brigade. After some time practicing, the squad commander feels confident enough to bring the bear, whom he has dubbed Siegfried, with him on the next raid. It turns out Siegfried is not the fastest of mounts, but he can get up to a decent speed for a short amount of time and doesn't even flinch at the sound of gunfire. As the men ride out toward the village, hoping to return with the plunder and glory, the other squads cheer with a raucous laughter as they see Siegfried lumbering by with planes of jokes about the commanding, ha commanding having found himself a Russian woman circulating. As the squad nears the village, they hear something that is exhilarating yet unnerving. The sound of gunshots fired by some village militia. While this raid will certainly be more dangerous than the usual ransacking of poor farmers' hovels, or hovels, the presence of a militia means that they have loot worth defending. The commander spurs Siegfried forward, and the horses beside him accelerate from a trot to a gallop. As the squadron begins to open fire, Siegfried suddenly jolts to a stop and slumps to the ground. The commander scrambles off the bear's beast's back to see what could be wrong. Fortunately, Siegfried is unharmed. It seems that like he just stumbled on a rock. While the commander is relieved, it does raise some concerns about Siegfried's combat efficiency. Bears, after all, are neither as fast nor agile as horses. Leading Siegfried onward may be a combat risk, but is it a worthy one? Can't stop here? Boy, right on! No, don't die. But train more troops. Oh, this tree with Lysenko. Okay. There's a lot of things here. Holy crap. Request advisors. Steroids. Oh, that's kind of cool. Rage inducing hormones. Okay. Soviet stratagems. Soviet arms. Many of the weapons secured for the brigade from Lysenko's Magnogorsk stockpiles are ancient beyond all measure. Even some bear the double-headed Russian Imperial Eagle. But guns are guns, and as long as they can reliably shoot, they can be of value. We will distribute them to the men of the brigade, starting with the newest recruits, freeing up better weapons for our veterans. If they prove themselves and turn over the loot they find for distribution as is required, they can earn themselves a better weapon. And if they don't, there's always another recruit waiting, of course. Slightly content. Um, oh, they're just disorganized. I don't like that. Pillage of the land would be fun, but, hmm. A night to remember. As the conclusion of the latest raid, the bandits of the Bergage could scarcely believe their luck. In the cellar of an old distillery, they found a gigantic stash of alcoholic beverages that somehow had not been looted in the decades since Russia's collapse. Returning home with a mountain of loot and captives, Dolvanga proclaimed that the might or the night would see the greatest party in the history of Russia. The vodka flowed freely, and the loot was spread far and wide. Well, quickly, the men of the brigade became heavily inebriated, losing whatever remaining restraint they had left. As the sun set, the camp descended into cacophony of wild celebration, senseless violence, and unspe unspeakable debauchery. The captives were brutalized even more than their normal fare for the band, and by morning, few would remain alive, and even fewer would be happy to be. The night soon devolved into further haze of chaos as brawls broke out over the dwindling alcohol for the first time in decades. The streets of Orsk were alive, albeit with a sound of jeers, screams, and death. As the overcast sky began to lighten with the dawn, the men of the brigade woke disheveled, disheveled, hung over, and surely, and surly. Blood, feces, and other fluids lay splattered throughout the streets, and the bodies of those killed by either the chaos of the night or by simple alcohol poisoning littered the ground here and there. Minimal effort was made to clean the place, and soon the bandits simply returned to their more cohesive roles of brutality, hoping to avoid incurring the wrath of Dovanga and his splitting headache. What happens in Orsk stays in Orsk, and there is but to do and die. Ultimately, the commander decides that Siegfried will be of more use participating in the raid than sitting around. Without a moment to spare, he climbs back on back onto the bear's back, cracks the makeshift reins, and sends his mount 
mount onwards into the thick of battle. The bullets whiz all around, the militiamen having retreated behind the windows and alleyways of the village. But the men of the Dolvanga Brigade are experienced enough to successfully fight back their enemies, and ride through the streets shooting everything that moves as the front of the squadron is the commander, leading a roaring Siegfried and spreading chaos in the streets. Finally, the men prepare a charge against the last stronghold of local resistance, the village's tiny ramshackle Orthodox church. Although most locals scatter at the sight of it over a dozen bandits armed to the teeth galloping towards them, several remain determined to the last and fire off a few more rounds from the rifles before being shot or cut down. Most of these bullets fly by harmlessly except for one. Having been shot in the head, Siegfried comes to a crushing halt. No! And the commander is thrown to the ground. He scrambles over to his dying moment, or dying mount, cradles Siegfried's bloodied head, and closes his dark eyes for the last time. The commander stands up, pulls out a pistol, and walks over towards the cowering villagers taking refuge in the church with determination in his eyes. This one's for Siegfried. Good night, sweet prince. No, Siegfried! No! Ah, oh, Siegfried has perished in battle. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Soviet mastery. We'll probably do that one next, too. The Brigade has survived and thrived by understanding its environment. When we broke away from Germany, we had to adapt our doctrine, altering it to suit the Urals and the needs for raiding. With a new deal in place, Lysenko's instructors are imparting to us Soviet tactics. Some of the smarter men have realized that combining the two, Soviet strength and discipline with the unorthodoxy and unpredictability of raiding maneuvers, could give us a real advantage over those who would see us destroyed. So we will. Very good. Then we will. But Soviet arms first. Great, 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 my friends. But, I hope there's one more we can read. Pillage and burn. For old time's sake, my friends. For old time's sake. Why not? Oh, they took over Levant. So be it. Yeah, I think we're at max on stability for now, so it doesn't even matter doing any of this stuff anyway, so. And, my friends, we have one. But, if you enjoyed this episode, please do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, if you haven't already. And please let me know, should we do Strike Orenburg? Should we Strike at the Peasantry? Or should we strike at the Beatles? Please let me know in the comment section below. But like I said, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I will see you tomorrow as we'll have a great time with Mr. Herr Oscar Delvango. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.